On today's episode of Tuesday Talk to Opie, I chat with MC, poet, and writer Fifth. We get into his journey in the music business and how he has learned to manage expectations from himself, from others, and the world. Join us for today's conversation. and welcome to another episode of Tuesday Talks. Today, my guest is the talented MC, writer and poet, Fifth, with a new album out now. Um, this is Fine, Volume 1 on Bandcamp. Welcome to the show, Fifth. Hi, hi, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm so happy to have you on the show. As you know, I'm a big fan of you as a person, and I became a big fan of you as a musician uh, when I received my uh, the CD, Clandestine, your first CD. I remember popping it into my car, and I played that CD over and over and over. And whenever I had like someone in my car that was the first CD I would play, I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm not even going to say who it is if I know the person, just want them to listen to it, enjoy it, and then give me a feedback like, wait, yeah. who is this? And then, of course, I had to mention you, like, <laughs> give them more <laughs> details about it. Um, but at that time, you were called the Fifth Estate, but now you're just simply Fifth. So what um, inspired that name change, and what's the story behind the name? Um, so before that name, uh, I went by Michael Blaze. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> contrary to popular belief, that is that had nothing to do with smoking weed. Um, <laughs> like, absolutely nothing. Uh during the time but uh I was kind of like in the neighborhood for a new name because since I've ever started like doing music and creating and putting stuff out publicly I'd always struggled with I don't know a name a moniker I'd always liked the idea of having um like a pen name you know what I'm saying to like push my art out through um I'm obviously been a, a huge fan of a million other people that have done it and done it so well so I didn't grow up with any nicknames for real for real um like you know my name's Michael so, you know, the standard Mike, you know, whatever, my, a couple of nicknames that my family had, but nothing I wanted to necessarily emulate or anything like that. So at the time when I was a teenager and I was going through things and it was just like, all right, cool, I'm going to use my name, but I'm going to use my name and put some spice on it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but to, to answer the question, um, I was reading a book. I was reading a book or reading an article. And um, in the article, they had mentioned this concept of the fifth estate um, in reference to like a group of people. And I didn't really understand it. And I'm typically the type of person, like, if I don't understand it and I can, like, at least try to find it out, I'm going I'm to try to figure it out. So I just did a Google search and um, I saw how the, the concept related to um, just class systems. Um, and that's a real prevalent thing throughout history in every nation on the planet. You know what I'm saying? Um, the have the have nots you know what i'm saying the the proletariat the bourgeoisie not to go too deep into it but just social social stratification you know what i'm saying and being in america like we all know too well about that so um i like that the fifth estate was representative of the largest body of people which was the common man the common man and woman you know what i'm saying the common person um and i kind of i just resonated with that because it's like as much as i as much as i feel my feel that i am like different from a lot of people around me i know that i'm in a lot of ways not you know what i'm saying i'm just just another dude doing the thing you know what i'm saying like <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day that's all any of us are you know what i'm saying people making choices and and following up on actions to, to try to make whatever type of impact so um i was like the fifth estate i was like that's that's kind of that's weird that's esoteric that's kind of like right up my alley you know what i'm saying so I was like, yeah, boom, that's me. Um, then over time, I immediately realized that I, I think I made the decision in um, 2013. And this is a super long answer, but, you know. No, I, I want the answer. I want, I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> People want to know. <laughs> I, think, I think this is, I think I made that decision probably prior to like that, um, the Snowden, whole, that whole Snowden incident in the okay. week. Thing. Um so like and then they made the movie with benedict cumberbatch called the fifth estate and then i learned that there was a band from the uk from the 60s called the fifth estate and then there started to be like <laughs> as much as i as much as i have i'm at odds with this word there started to be a branding issue right at least when it came to the internet you know what i'm saying um so it got to a point where i was so active anyway uh people call me fifth for short and it just it just stuck 
And it got to the point where people, there were people I was friends with that like were randomly turning me one day and be like, yo, what's your name? Like, like what's your actual name? Like, right. like I know you're hanging <laughs> like, out. I don't like, know your name anymore. I don't know that you're Mike anymore. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like, you know, everybody's, everybody's uh, going towards fifth or whatever. And then um, the decision to go to the Roman numeral um, just prior to the pandemic was, I don't know, I, I like individual flair. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, it, you know, the running joke between, like, you know, the, the team and everything is that it's like, it looks like this. You know right. I was like, you almost have to ask yourself, wait, how do you pronounce that? Like, yeah, is it? yeah. And that's, what, that's why I've been so adamant about, the, you know, the superscript, because at least for, for anybody who's at least, you know, vaguely familiar, you'll, you'll put two and two together. Um, but it, it's worked and I, I've liked it. And, and like over the years, I've, I've messed with, I, I sketch a lot. So I, I, I mess around with like different, I don't know, visual concept pieces and stuff. I'm also a huge nerd. So like, I don't know. I like, I like, I've, I've grown fond of, of the way that people present things. You know what I'm saying? Like, like Black Panther, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Gundam and anime and stuff like that. And, you know, Scott Pilgrim, like, I, I, I like that type of stuff. So it's, I play around with a lot. So, so yeah, at its core, outside of like how it audibly sounds and how it looks, it was just something I wanted to be connected to the people. You know what I'm saying? It's always just been like, hey, like I'm just another dude from a place, but I have thoughts and observations about the world around me. You know what I'm saying? That I feel like are, are thoughts and observations that any of us can make. Right, you know, right. Um, you're, and, common, and you're a just, common man, but these are your specific views that makes you uncommon too. <laughs> yeah, 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 honestly. Yeah. You know so what is your creative process like? Like, how do you write a song before you even think about performing or even making an album? What do you, how do you come up with it? Or do you think, do you say to yourself, I want to create an album and then work on the songs? Or what is your process? Well, um, it's changed. I mean, like, it's always evolving. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a real feelings-based person, which is honestly like a real blessing and a curse because sometimes if I'm not feeling it I'm just not feeling it mm -hmm. um but it's 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 evolved so once upon a time when I first started um even anything creative before like I joined band in school and stuff it kind of started with a piano um my mother my dad gifted my mom not not this but a, a keyboard like it um way back in the day for their anniversary and it was up in the living room and I would always think, 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 you know, uh, just because, and I've always been able to like play by ear and stuff. So initially like any of my musical expression was kind of an extension of that. If I heard something, mm -hmm. um, I would try to copy it. Um, and it was kind of that way with everything. When I picked up the trumpet, it was a lot of that. My, my band director, he could play a lot of instruments. Uh, my middle school band director specifically, he play a lot of instruments, but he favored the trumpet. And as I was playing and learning my way around the instrument and the sound and the tonality and everything like that, I would literally mimic, mimic what he would do. Like the way that he sounded, the way that I imagined he would uh, either either breathe or, you know, deal with his his amateur, you know, the way, the way you put your lips and stuff against okay. the knob and everything. Like a whole science behind that. And I, I would just be like, okay, if that's how it is, like, let me try that. Because whatever he's doing, I like the way it sounds. And I don't know quite how to do that. So I'm just trying my best. I learned how to sing that way. I learned how to play that that way. I learned how to play these that way. And I'm not, I'm not that great, but you know what I'm saying? Like that's so how you're I familiar how with how their sound are made and how you want, yeah. how you want it to be. How, yeah. How I want to employ them. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, and then around the time when I started rapping, um, I had been making beats. Like I had gotten into making beats when I was uh, 15, 14, 15, 16 um, on bootleg programs on my computer. At, at, at my house you know what I'm saying and me and my friends would crowd around a little we have one of those little um you know like the regular headphone jack uh microphone desktop microphones and stuff we would huddle around that and, re and record songs Is it, are you talking about the little microphones that you would attach to the the, <laughs> yeah. the little tiny things and it's like yeah. a little disc it's like the... <laughs> yeah yeah like real real low budget you know what I mean um but like that was where I started. And and obviously, like as kids, it was like, oh man, like wow, like we can do this, or you know, like, and especially like at the time, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, like TI was my favorite rapper at the time. 
um, now it's just, now it's different. But <laughs> T.I. was my favorite rapper at the time. Right. Um, I think, I think um, the name of the album is escaping me, but like, I think that was one of the first rap albums that was purchased for me. Okay. Like I was allowed to buy um, and I kind of bought it on accident. Um, but that's kind of what it was. Like there was, it was like kind of fantasy, but there was no expectation. And, and by the time I had moved on past high school and then coincidentally figured out that, hey, maybe I want to do this music thing with my life. I was already at West Point. Um, and then going through that and everything. So the process kind of turned into a whenever I could. Mm. Um, so whenever I had the free time or whenever I could listen to music and stuff like that, or just generate ideas, I, you know, I journaled a lot and, and stuff like that. I always, always put ideas and I always have a million ideas and I, and I've always been better or worse about putting them down. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I'm always trying to like get them out in some type of way. So, um, I feel like I'm trying to spell out my whole life story, but it gets to the point where now today I'm back to where I was as a teenager. So the creative process is essentially um, kind, of, kind of anything, you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 um, I work a lot with this producer, Mac, Max Vista. He's like, that's, that's my boy. We've been making music together now for, um, well, we met in 2019, I believe. So yeah, about two years strong. And it's weird because it feels like way longer than that's that. Like <laughs> we made a lot of music together, like a lot, a lot of rec- like more music than I've made with anybody. In my life. Right. I'm definitely f- familiar with Max Vista. Like I, I yeah. do see that, you- <laughs> <laughs> which is great. You found a, you know, a group of people or someone that you know that you can make great music with. So, yeah. yeah. So it might be tossing on one of Max's beats on repeat or something like that. And then like, I just, I start either if I have ideas down or if I have like a melody in my head, it's, it's really, it's really up in the air. You know what I'm saying? And then sometimes I, I don't write. Um, okay. Not that I write and I record like freestyle or anything like that. But like sometimes I don't write and I just have like more melodic ideas in my head. And then it's like, I'm back to producing now. Okay. I got, I got in, I got fully into producing um, just before the pandemic and through the pandemic. Um, I got back into it, got my hands around it, got my mind around it and I've gotten, um, pretty good relatively quickly um and then i also picked up audio engineering um to like audio engineer a lot of my own stuff um because obviously i'm not spending a lot of time in any other people's studios so Mm -hmm. the the ability and the capacity to have my own equipment um you know i've made that investment to like my own system and stuff like that let me be able to take it from start all the way through a finished record and stuff um it's 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 different it's it's all it's all over the place, um, clandestine specifically. I'm all over the place, right? Clandestine specifically. I came up with the idea for clandestine shortly after I came up with the name change. I had the con the album concept and even the artwork idea for two years. The art was made probably the art was made first actually, which is wow. weird. I, I, yeah. I, I've done, I've done very few projects like that, but like I've, I've, I've been in love with the idea of concepts for a long time. So I, I came up with this idea and I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this, right? It was just like, and it wasn't until 2014 that I was able to um, get, I had, there was a, a producer, I love Brandon. Um, everybody needs to check him out. Um, he's an incredible dude out of Florida. He's talented. I mean, he's in commercials and he's on Netflix and all this stuff now. He's, he's doing amazing things, but he took a, from my perspective, he took a bet on me. He liked what I was doing. I had a couple of freestyles and stuff out. He was like, yo, let's, let's do a project. And he, so he took a bet on me and I'm like, cool, perfect. I have this whole idea. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, let me lay it out for blah, 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 blah. We did seven tracks. You know, he sent me beats, feedback, blah, blah, blah. And all digital and everything. So, I mean, to this day, I still haven't met him. Um, wow. And we put it together like that, you know, put all the package together or put the album, or the album together, packaged it up and then, and then pushed it out. But um, I don't know, like, like things, yeah, I'll, I'll say that things are like project driven. Um, I like onesies and twosies and stuff like that. And I've had to adjust to like the new way of doing things in terms of like music and like people's expectation, what output and everything. Right. Um, so I've been moving from a model of like focusing on like bigger projects to like more bigger projects that take more time to shorter projects, shorter periods of time. Um, but still like 
<laughs> still pretty like you know heavy handed. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so yeah, because yeah, even it, in this year, you also did um, uh, Bleeding Hearts also came out this year earlier this year, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and so the time frame between that and this is fine was about two months. So yeah. it seems like you had like a lot of, but they're also very different. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> like they're yeah. So like sweet thing off of Bleeding Hearts. Oh my gosh, I play that over. <laughs> so like it's completely different than this is fine in terms of what you're talking about and the feeling and what you're trying to convey. So mm-hmm. like you said, I guess it, it is project driven. But do you? how do you know when you're comfortable to put out a project when you're saying, okay, you know what, this is, this is what I want to do now. I'm going to, it's, I'm taking it out. Everyone can listen to it now. When do you, when are you confident about doing that? That's very, um, lately it's been, um, when I get to the point where I feel like the mix is right, this is fine. Was finished conceptually and everything. Um, was all complete, I think by like August or October or August or September of last year. Okay. But I sat with the mixes for a long time because I'm, st- I'm still in the process of learning to be, learning to engineer for myself. I'm not going to call myself an engineer, but learning to engineer my music. Um, so, so it's been that. In the past, it's been, how do I feel about this song? And, and there was a little bit of that on This Is Fine. There were... There were records on there that I wrestled with for a while before I really got the recording down, before I really got the mixing down and then, you know what I'm saying, so on and so forth. Um, and even, even with like um, The Bleeding Heart, those songs were kind of, so I did those songs, interesting story. I um, went to Houston, I was invited to Houston by a producer and engineer and absolute legend. Um, bass heavy um his his resume is insane and and the the experience was it was it was interesting for for a multitude of reasons but i learned a lot from i learned a lot from him and it was like kind of the first opportunity that i've had to to sit with somebody in that capacity and actually work with them on some records um but he invited us out to the studio and we left vegas to go out there approximately one day before the pandemic was declared. <laughs> so we, that, so that's we, great. <laughs> yeah, so we went to Houston late as hell. And when we get in and everything, and then like the world is imploding and there's no pick toilet paper everywhere <laughs> or anywhere. And, and you know what I'm saying? Like we went in the grocery store trying to find food for our Airbnb and we just had to like, oh, well, we eat this. Uh, do we eat that? Yeah, sure. Because you know right. what I'm saying. We really everything like, was gone yeah. off the shelves. You know, yeah, it was insane. You know, um, there was a lot of soap though. Weird. <laughs> um, you know what I mean. But um, a lot of hand sanitizer and soap, but no toilet paper. It's like hmm. <laughs> they're gonna take the anyway. shower with the toilet paper too. So, no yeah, yeah, you know what I'm <laughs> right. but while we were out there, um, we were supposed to be out there for a week. We were only out there for a couple of days, but we did those records while we were, while we were there. Um, Max came with me. Um, like I said, we, we went out there, went to the studio and we just got to work because we only had so much time to, to work with and everything. So are you saying that it was even like unfinished? Like you didn't even get to have all the music you wanted to have on the album or were you? Um, no, not necessarily. Cause I didn't even go out. I didn't go out there with any expectations. Again, okay. get back to the expectation management thing. You know what I'm saying? Cause I didn't want to go out there with the, with the expectation that that experience was going to proverbially change everything for me. Gotcha. I'll, I'll say that it changed things for me in the ways that they probably needed to change in terms okay. of what I learned. You know what I'm saying? Um, but no, I, I went out there like whatever. Like I remember the first day in the studio and he was like, okay, cool. Like we met, exchanged pleasantries, whatever, whatever. And he's like, all right, cool. What y'all want to do? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I, I can play you some records. You know what I'm saying? But like at the time I didn't have any unreleased material. So I played him like older stuff. And then um, Max came through, he started working on some stuff and then we, we showed him some other stuff that we were working on and just whipped ourselves up into this friend, this productive frenzy of like working on these records while we were in there. And then it wasn't until much, 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 much after well into the pandemic that I was like, you know what? These records have been sitting on my hard drive for months. Like bass went through, uh, recorded me, uh, you know, did them up nice. Like those are probably like my best sounding records mm. ever. 
you know, like I've never heard myself sound like that on a record, but um, I was like, yeah, it went into that. And I was like, you know what? I should put these records out. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they're great. They, they deserve spotlight. And it's like, and they're different. They're different from stuff I've done in the past. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, I, and I've, I've talked, I've been able to talk with, with um, the handful of mentors and stuff or, or impromptu mentors that I have in like the music space and stuff that have told me, um, you know, versatility is one of the, one of the most valuable things I can have as an artist, you know, and the good, the good thing is that I don't necessarily have to develop it. I just have to embrace it. You know what I'm saying? So uh, it's because it, again, like at the end of the day, it's about ideas, putting down ideas, getting them out and everything. And then whatever they turn into, you know, just, just giving my all to them, creating them and then putting them out to the world with, again, with expectation management, not no expectations, but just a healthy right. set of expectations based on the people that I can reach and, and the impact I can have on their lives and what that does and how the universe sends it back to me. You know what I'm saying? But um, I don't know. It's all over the place. But I can say right now I am working on several projects that it's like, hey, I'm going to do this project and I'm going to do this project. And I'm also working on this. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, I'm probably working on the most music I've ever worked on in my life right now. So it's it's nice. It's fun. <laughs> Do you ever find yourself in, you know, having a creative block, like where you just don't even know what you want to want to write? I kind of, I, I kind of honestly fluctuate in and out of that. I learned after a while that it was, um, cause before as a result of time, it was, Hey, I can only write in these specific moments. So it was really a feeling thing. I would be listening to something perfect song. Um, I can mention F U C K from stuck mm-hmm. in the 90s. Right. Um, I remember specifically when I, when I wrote the, the, the basic, uh, foundation of that song and I was listening to that particular instrumental by, uh, my design on, on repeat at four in the morning on the other side of the world, dealing with whatever I was dealing with. Right. And, and let me pause the positivity for a second came to mind because I always felt like I always feel like I try to be a genuinely like you know what I'm saying like I don't want to person no, right I don't want to bring nobody no bullshit I don't like complaining you know what I'm saying but like I that was the point of my time the point in time in life I think I was like I was 26 I was like I'm fed up I was fed up with a lot of shit you know what I'm saying so <laughs> I remember when that happened so like there were a lot of moments with songs that were that were like that and then after it turned it was oh you have a couple of songs you should do a project you know what I'm saying um, okay. And then that, that changed as like my productivity productivity is like picked up and stuff. And I've tried to be a little bit more deliberate without being over over the top. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the overthinking stuff. But the writing piece, it's these days, it's kind of it's a mixture of when I'm feeling it and um, also like techniques that I've learned to kind of, again, express a creativity. I know when I feel creativity, I know when I have an itch to try and get something out. But I've challenged myself to even if I am, I know, and I learned this from Max, I learned this from Morgan. I have, a, I have more than a handful of multidisciplinary artists in my life, regardless of what they're known for. Mm-hmm. And this, this is something that like I saw mirrored very early with artists like Andre 3000 or like Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park or um, a lot of people you can mention that you, hey, you know them, like, you know Mike Shinoda, if you, if you know Mike Shinoda, you know Mike Shinoda is a lead the, the, not the lead singer, but the front man, uh, rapper, vocalist of Linkin Park. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Beside Chester Bennington, re- uh, rest in peace. You know what I'm saying? But if you know Linkin Park, you know that he did a lot of their albums. He put them together. He did a lot of the artwork himself. Okay. He painted and everything like that. And at first I was like, I was like, uh, I didn't quite understand it, even though I did a couple of different things as a kid. And over, the, over time, I didn't have enough time to do anything else. So I was like, in my spare time, all I'm doing is rapping. All I'm doing is writing down raps. And I had to go back to that place of if the words aren't coming, it's cool because stressing about it's not going to help me. So I'll put it down. I'll pick up a guitar. I'll plug it into the amp. You know what I'm saying? I'll burp, 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 burp. I might not write that day. You know what I'm right. saying? I might hop on the piano or whatever. I might make a beat. I might crunch out a melody or something like that. I might write a song I sing. You know what I'm saying? There's any number of things. And then... Or I might sit here and work on sketches or concept ideas or, or putting together merch and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? I freed myself up time-wise and create creativity-wise to like be able to address 
this um, solid spectrum of things that I know I'm capable of doing. You know what I'm saying? Like I did the This Is Fine artwork. This Is Fine is probably the most involved. It's the most involved project that I've put out since my first one. Like period, I did the, I did the mixing. Uh, or I did some of the mixing. I, I shared that responsibility on some of the records, but like I did, I supervised the mixing. I did a lot of it. I did the artwork. I did, and this isn't like patting myself on the back, but it's like, again, from that approach of like giving that multidiscipline the, um, aspect of it. Yeah. You know different what I'm saying? parts of your creative, your creative energy and space. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, everything's kind of revolved, kind of evolved like that. I don't, I try not to hold myself to that expectation of just because I think I want to write and I don't right. write, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? I used to be real fucked up in the past. You know what I'm saying? Um, because I'd be like, man, especially when I was working on um, how I feel. I was like, oh, how I feel. And I don't think I've ever told anybody this. How I feel, what was released and what I, I had a whole other album that I ended up losing. Uh, and that was weird because that was the first time that happened to me. Um, and I didn't think it would happen to me, but it did. Uh, like I, I lost a lot of like like files and and records. Wow. So yeah, it was it was. How did that happen? Um, digital stuff not 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 being good steward of my digital files. Basically, so you're just like okay, I'll, I'll it'll be there. You just had so yeah. much confidence that oh, yeah, dang. I took it I took it for granted. Honestly, you know what I'm saying. Now I have everything like redundantly backed up on the cloud, so it's it's a different situation now. But um. <laughs> Even in that process of writing that album, it was like, there were moments where I was just like, it was like, I would put myself through despair trying to write songs. Mm. And that was before I decided I was going to make beats again. That was before I decided I was going to engineer my own stuff. So I was driving myself insane, not because I couldn't write, but because I refused to do anything else, you know? Um, so I've just, I don't know, I've just been learning a lot about that. And, I, and again, I've learned to like really get on that train of putting down ideas, either whether it's a recording in my phone or it's okay. anything and just put the idea down. Because even if you're not able to flesh it out right now, doesn't mean it's not going to be, it doesn't mean it's not a good idea. doesn't mean right. it's not going to be able to flesh out later. You know what I'm saying? Make, you got to make room, period. You know what I'm saying? That's, and that's why I had to say what I said to you before we really got into this about what you've been doing. I think that's over half of the, the, the thing, you know what I'm saying? It's putting stuff out. You could still be stuck in a phase right now that I've been stuck there before of like conceptually building something to a T. Mm. You're like, oh, psh, this is gonna fuck them up when it comes out. Right, you know I mean? <laughs> right. And not actually like, doing it. You don't have nothing. Yeah. It's just hearsay. You've just been talking about shit. And I realized there was a point in time in life with a, a, a lot of things in, in life that I, I realized I was telling people as if to pacify myself. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I was, I was just like talking a lot and I wasn't doing a whole lot because I was holding myself hostage in such a way. It was really, really, really weird. Really right. Like this, this is what it would look like if I actually did it. So I want you to know about it, but I'm not actually even working towards it yeah exactly <laughs> and then and then outside outside of like the day-to-day -day stuff that i do on my own i open myself up to start really working with other people and like people that i've built relationships with I, i've changed especially like max helped change that that was really the first time since i was a teenager that i've been working in the same room with somebody that's different you you hear people talk all the time about sending records back and forth that's a very efficient way to do things it happens all the time Sitting in the room with somebody as you're working on something is a totally different experience. It's it just period. You know, I mean? and it's like even if somebody's in the room that's not even necessarily a part of the record, just them being there. That energy. It has something to do with it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, there, and there are things that come to life in a way that just wouldn't come to life. I argue that they wouldn't come to life otherwise. You know what I mean? So um, working in in spaces with people has been major working in basis studio was major uh, when i did monotonies in with the homie uh late night loki we did that over the course of a few months but we did all those records in person you know what i'm saying um i think we did a couple on the front end and then after i left the area i flew back out there and we finished like the last like five or six records i think to to, to round out the um you know the ep and stuff so I've opened myself up a lot more to being in that space because I found that when I'm in that space with somebody mm -hmm. and they're like, it's, it's like, it's like, um, 
it ends up being on some on some like uh like bas- basketball and like an alley oop. You right. know what I'm saying? An alley oop. I don't know why I said that like that. And then alley oop, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, it ends up being like that in which like somebody's in this space trying to do you you're both going towards a common goal, but everybody's playing their part. You know what I'm saying? So like Max will be in there like a fiend and like uh doing his thing it's crazy and he'll start making beats damn near in silence it's weird i don't know how he does it but i've seen him do it on multiple kids and i'm sitting back there and i'm like i don't know what's going on whatever or i'm working on something whatever whatever and then we're going and it's just like it just works itself up into a frenzy and then every time i've done that with a project it's just been like so effortless i've done a mul- i've done um like six seven records in like a day you know what i'm saying and like i don't i don't typically do a lot of like popcorn microwave ass songs you know what i'm saying and i don't say that disrespectfully i say that in terms of like uh length you know what i'm saying i don't i don't do a lot of like really really short songs right even though that's, that's changed recently um but like I, I tend to do like longer records or whatever so uh you know three four minutes plus um <clears throat> so um i don't know like those moments it's, it's so I, I don't i don't know i can't i can't really describe it but it's great it's invaluable well you know shout out to max vista for the great energy you know i mean obviously he's been a part of a big part of your growth and in your creativity process too so that's really good <laughs> so speaking about like you know collaborating and meeting creatives and people who inspire um you know just the best or helping you produce the best work possible um i'm i've definitely seen a lot of the work that you've collaborated with one of my favorite is um getaway drug with um billy free um (laughs) like that's i love that song so you know who if dead or alive who would you love to like if you could collaborate any actor or person that you would want to collaborate with oh man i would say <clears throat> and this was, and a lot of this is kind of like some childhood fantasy stuff. So bear with me. But I, I, be, I would love to be able to spend, um, like a, like maybe a couple of weeks interrupted time, un, uninterrupted time in the studio with um, somebody like Pharrell, um, um, somebody like Mad Lib, um, and then somebody like and i know you didn't you i know you only asked me one no it's um, okay I, more is okay but, <laughs> it's your but fantasy like, <laughs> but the thing the thing that i'm going for with this is like uh outside of like loving what they've created musically over the vastness of their careers and stuff but like they've always approached stuff from the perspective of like making um thing like they're it's like like a fashion designer they make clothes that fit mm. you know what I'm saying? and if they're in there dressing a particular model or particular act they're making clothes that fit that person you know what i'm saying and i would be i would i would be very 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 interested to see what a project i do looks like coached and produced by a pharrell or something like that again childhood fantasy type stuff but i, I mean think, hey it can be a reality you never know you never, you never know, know. <laughs> you never know whatsoever. but I, I think i think it would be a really great experience you know what i'm saying especially because like just to be in a, in a studio space with somebody who, regardless of how long they've been doing it, and they showed me this too, regardless of how long they've been doing it, they know that you're coming with something. You're always gonna come with something unique as long as you're being yourself. You know what I'm saying? You're always gonna come with something that they're not gonna get nowhere else. So it's like people who are in that space and open and receptive to what it is that you bring to the table and then catering to that. Mm-hmm. And again, as evidenced with some of those records with bass and stuff, I'm like from a pure, audio perspective i was like these sound incredible incredible you know what i mean so it's like that that just means like again like the, you know what is the what is the ceiling you know what i'm saying infinity limit you know what i'm saying like, <laughs> hey, you know what i mean right but, <laughs> right that's yeah i mean i'm looking forward to that uh collaboration with pharrell so you know when that happens so uh, you did an interview back in 2017 with The Prospector, and you mentioned that the greatest hip hop act of all time was A Tribe Called Quest. So I wanted to know, like, you said that they influenced, like, your traditional hip hop sound. How do you think that your sound has changed, like, evolved over when you first started? And what would you describe your sound as today? Um, 
I actually had a, cousin, a conversation with my, my little cousin about this uh, about a week or so ago. Because he made, he made a, a comment, not a negative comment, but he made a comment about kind of how things have been sounding, especially like on This Is Fine. He, he made a comment about like uh, kind of like the darker tone of it and stuff like that. And I had to let him know my growing up in Texas, um, I didn't realize this until I got into college, but like a lot of my early influences were all Southern based. And like that, and that includes like in the in the mid 2000s like when i was in high school and stuff like that like the type of sound that was coming out of the south to include what was coming out of texas it was a certain type of certain type of sound that i fell in love with and it's like it's a bit typically a bit darker in in tonality not necessarily in subject matter um a bit grittier a lot um a lot more programmed you know what i'm saying at least like with the drums and stuff like that and like real like 808 music and stuff like that real boom type stuff you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and, and 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 real like again you got a good system and you're listening to stuff and like you you feel that you know what i'm saying it's more it's more than just like the audio and everything it's, it's that what comes with music that's really why we like stuff you know what i'm saying everything else is just icing on the top we really like it because of how we make how it makes us feel and stuff right so um it's like i, I grew up on that sound you know what i'm saying like outcast um Outcast was was huge when it was huge, you know what I'm saying? It, was, it really wasn't after until after a few years that I really got into boom bap for real. And that was after I moved to New York. And then when I really I I'd been familiar with a tribe called Quest for a long time, but after I got out there and really did my homework and I got to see them, I uh, rocked the bells in 2010 and changed a lot of my perspective on things. A lot of my perspective on things and especially like again with boom bap and stuff and that's another specific type of like hip-hop and stuff that has a very special place in my heart because there's nothing like it in the same way there's nothing like the um you know like the the southern uh organized noise three six mafia type sound you know what i'm saying and i know there's mm -hmm. two vast different places but that type of sound and everything um I don't know. This is kind of what I grew up on and everything. So it's like, yeah, I've always loved the boom bap stuff. I always loved, it goes back to the versatility of it. You know what I mean? Um, I like, I like a lot of stuff and I know how to make a lot of stuff. You know what I'm saying? And it's been not about learning how to, but embracing the fact that I can do that because once upon a time I was afraid of putting myself in a box and that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. like I, I did at least for me, I was afraid after stuck in the nineties being expected to be the hip hop, the, the boom bap guy. Mm. It, it was it was kind of because of, of the reactions. I had a lot of people my age or older who were very excited about it. Right. And it made me excited, but it was like, but I like other stuff, y'all. Yeah. And it made me fearful <laughs> that if I made different stuff, that I would lose all of that. You know what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, that's like, again, like the expectation management, because that's not what it's about. It's about like getting those ideas out, putting them down, pushing them out with free of expectation. Free of, free of all of that stuff, free of ego, free of whatever, because like, I cannot control it at the end of the day. Right. However good or bad it goes, I can't control it. You know what I'm saying? So all I can do is hope for the best, do my, put my best foot forward and the rest of it does itself. You know what I'm saying? And then all I have, it, the only choice I'm faced with is to be grateful in that, in that you know what I'm saying? Um, regardless of the outcome, good or right. bad, you know what I'm saying? being grateful. So um, yeah, they're, they're amazing. I know I haven't done a lot of talking about them, but they're amazing. Honestly, like, the leg, like honestly, because it's like everybody calls New York the mecca of hip hop, rightfully so. And, and we all know that 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 mecca that took a migration to Atlanta. That's public knowledge. You know what I'm saying? Um, but it's it's such a like prevailing sound that permeated through everything else that I like. You know what I'm saying? And it's not to mention everybody as an individual. Um, Q-tip one of my favorite artists of all one of my favorite creators of all time you know what i'm saying every i was i was in a q-tip before i was into a tribe called quest okay i had uh Kamala abstract and um the other album escapes me i was a q-tip fan before i was a tribe called quest fan and once i got into tribe called quest it blew my mind i was like oh my god like, what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? this nigga has more you know <laughs> Fife dog incredible incredible mc you know what I'm saying? Ali Shaheed Muhammad, crazy. Jerobi White, nuts. Everybody who was ever affiliated and working around him, just that extended network of creatives and especially being reflective of a time and everything like that, you know, largely talking about like the Soquarians and everything. Erica Badu, Questlove, The Roots, 
you know what I'm saying? Bilal, like all those, extensions those, of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, and all those people who were like, and then this is all music that ended up shaping me and stuff. And like, oh, they're a part of that. And it's like, oh, they're, and I don't, just for me, you know what I'm saying? It's just like happenstance is like my walk in life because hip hop is so, so vast and so varied and the, and the history is so like rich, you know what I'm saying? Across the nation, not just in New York. Right. Um, so to see something like that early on toward, early on with like hip hop's um, commercial appeal, you know what I'm saying? For, for them to see like the extended impact that they have made, and especially in, in what I do, I love them. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. I got I got um, a hat that I, I it's up on the wall. It's a, um, a Stussy Tribe Called Quest collaboration. Whenever they did that, I don't know what year it was. I'm not really big into that stuff, but I walked in the store and I saw it. You saw it. I don't it. know how much it was, but it was way more than I wanted to spend on a hat. But I needed that. <laughs> you know, I needed that. 100%. So you've mentioned that, Um, I mean, we've talked about it a little bit about just that it's how you feel that also influences, you know, what, what you create or how you create it. And I've, you know, seen from your music, sometimes it's about, it's sad. Sometimes it's happy. And sometimes it's about you just contemplating your existence in life, like in this world, <laughs> you know, who am I in this, in this crazy world? Uh, what is yeah. your favorite type of like, which one do you enjoy writing or which one comes easiest to you to write about? Um, oh, I would say typically the sad stuff, honestly. Um, and I, and I often wonder if that's a, if it's a, um, reflection of just our ability to be able to latch onto the negative because it's so readily available. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But I've also been working on a good way to like, you know, harness it. You know what I'm saying? Cause it's like, yeah, it might be writing from a place of sadness, but it also might have an end product of healing in one way or another, if not for me, for somebody else. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, not not too hard to get out. Unfortunately, with some of those records, I end up writing about some stuff that is uh, real personal, that it's a it's a level of vulnerability that I am at this time not sure that I'm ready to give to everybody. Um, but when that time comes, you know what I'm saying? Definitely, you know what I mean? But there, there's there's stuff that I've, I've written, again, not that it's crazy deep, it's just that it's real it's real personal, real, real sentimental in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would say that's the most, yeah, the most readily. Lately, it has been anything that I know will make the show go up. Anything that I know I'm going to have a good ass time performing. Okay. Because that is, that is my favorite shit like about this whole being an artist thing, not necessarily about being a creative, but being an artist. My favorite thing is performing. That is one of the major things that I know I took uh, for granted prior to the pandemic. Um, right. Haven't played the show, <laughs> haven't played a show since a, a private show that we put on back in September of 2019. So I'm feeling it, you know what I mean? Um, but I know that feeling of, of when I'm playing a song that I enjoy, that I know I love, that I know it's gonna make shit go up. You know what I'm saying? It, I know it's going to set it off. I know it's going to make one of my favorite things that shows is, is watching people's reaction. People I don't know, people I'm not familiar with or whatever, seeing somebody put their phone down because mm. it's something I did. And pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's right. like, and they, and, it, <laughs> and, it, and it's like, I've, I've been, I've been, um, I've been the crowds of varying sizes. You know what I'm saying? I've been, it, it's been seven people. Um, it's been, I don't know, I think like the most, like maybe like a hundred people and that's like by happenstance, you know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take credit for that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's been crowds of varying sizes and stuff. And it's like, man, like regardless, just watching for the people that are really into it, you know what I'm saying? It's especially seeing people that are, that are really invested in that like experience and stuff. It's like, you really share that moment with them. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's real cool. It, it's, it's, it's real rewarding. It's probably like the only instant gratification piece of this whole music thing that's healthy. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> um, I think anything else in the music, in this music space, that's instant gratification is probably detrimental. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, <laughs> right. it's, it's either feeding my ego or, or it's, or, you know, stroke my ear or something like that. And it's right. a false sense of security or something, something like that. When it's at a show, I just know whether it's stroke my ego or not. I know that it's like, this is a pure moment. Okay. Yeah. This is it's not something we can go get back. I'm not playing this record again. I'm not playing in this order, in this outfit, in this place, 
at this time and these stars, you know what I'm saying? Like none of this shit is right here, right now. And like, if I'm able to connect or if I'm just able to have fun with myself, I'm like, oh, that's, that's what I live for. I love it, honestly. I, I, I love it. I can't wait to go back to it. So what song would you uh, recommend? Like, you know, since you can't hype people up because, you know, live performances are not yeah. available right now, what song of yours can someone just, you know, you know, turn up by themselves <laughs> in their homes right now? Which one would you recommend? I would recommend Chaos Kid. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's because I feel like that is a song that is reflective of really just saying, uh, it's like, it's like, hey, man, fuck it. I'm out here. I'm doing this how I'm doing it. It's like, take it or leave it. That's it. That's it. And if I disrupt some shit, so be it. Like, that's, that's really like the larger point. You know what I'm saying? And it's it's loud. And I made the beat. And it's crazy. And it puts me in a, it puts me in a mood every time I hear it. I crank, the, I crank the speaker up to 12 every time I hear it. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, I got to, I need that. You know? So hopefully if, if, Anyone goes and listens to it, you know what I'm saying? I hope you feel the same, but play it loud because that's how it's, you know. That's how it's meant to be heard. (laughs) (laughs) What what has been your favorite venue that you've performed at prior, of course? (laughs) Yeah, prior to pandemic, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, My favorite performance ever was probably an impromptu performance I did of one song um, at Neon Desert back in 2018. Um, it wasn't my scheduled set for the festival. Um, my DJ was playing a silent disco set. And um, what started off as an attempt to tell him to play one of my records during his set turned into me performing Performance. during his set. And, um, you know, we were inebriated. It was, it was towards the end of the day. So it's like people have been out. It's a festival. You know how festivals do. It's a day long thing. So people have been out there for a second. Everybody's feeling good. And we're out there. And we had that bitch moving. There's a picture. Uh, I deleted it from my Instagram. Or archived it from my Instagram. There's a picture I have from that. It's my favorite picture from a show. Because the silent disco, the way they had it set up, there were two DJs playing simultaneously. You know, you can switch, toggle back and forth with your headphones to whichever channel you want to listen to. Oh, okay. Two, two DJs playing two different sets. It's cool. It's vibing. It looks insane from the outside looking in. Because you don't right. hear nothing. Because you but, can't, yeah. <laughs> right, you got the headphones on, you just, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're getting everything, and you can tell when somebody's on the same, ideally, if they can dance. Mm. Um, you can tell when somebody's on the same, and it's cool. It's it's an interesting thing. It's very surreal. It's a very 21st century way to enjoy ourselves, but it, I love it. And um, I go to play that record, and people stopped what they were doing. Out of curiosity, I'm sure, but they stopped what they were doing. I don't know if the other DJ kept playing. Because everybody switched over, like the entire crowd switched over to that channel to, to hear us rock out. And I, I think I played Soul, right? And um, wow. yeah, we had that bitch moving. It was crazy. And it was just like <laughs> such good energy. And the reason why I say that was my my favorite was because the stage wasn't like anything unique or whatever. Again, it was just that experience. The day before I had my scheduled slot to play, I played my, I played my set. It was good or whatever, but it didn't leave me with the same feeling that that three to four minute experience did rocking out for them people on that stage. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I was able to see some tangible in that I made a, an impact on people for that day. If you didn't enjoy nothing at that festival that day, you enjoyed that. You knew that at that moment, everyone enjoyed that. Yeah. And it was really cool. Um, and then I'll say like my honorable mention was performing at Facebook. Cause that was probably the most insane, like what, um, outside of like the, the other ethical gripes about the company. Um, wow. They have a lot of money. <laughs> That's all I'll say. The, <laughs> the Facebook headquarters, you know, where, where Marky Mark works is insane. It is an insane place. Um, it's amazing. It's an amazing place. But, you know, aside from all the ethical concerns. All the other, uh, and, and, you know, privacy the ruining, stuff. Yeah, <laughs> the ruining of Instagram, by the way. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Instagram oh, has become a, a, sh- a shopping center at times. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, man. I had Instagram for about two years before I knew it was a social media tool as well. I was right. using my photos, you know. I there was a time I, I I feel like I had Instagram before it became like I was like, what? I could have all this stuff. I didn't even know how to use this. Mm-hmm. All I was doing was just posting pictures of fruits or something. What was I thinking? I this shit I thought <laughs> was cool or whatever. And, and, then, and then it's weird how it grew into like this expectation. And, and, and right. A quick, and a quick caveat on that note the expectation piece 
and and what I learned about like my relationship with all that kind of stuff and why I talked that way about it. When I when I came back from overseas from my assignment and really during that time for whatever I went through, that was like the beginning of the time period where I wrote stuff in the 90s. And I came back with a, a very hefty amount of determination. I, and I was very determined. I was like, you know what? I feel like I'm wasting time. You know what I'm saying? I, I feel like I'm not really putting my pounds to the metal. And I made some things happen as a result of that. And I was very happy for it. However, with social media, at the time that I started to gain traction because of what I was doing physically outside in, in the city of El Paso and wherever I was going, um, because of that traction, I had started to put subconsciously a lot of stock into it. Then probably about six to eight months after that happened, the first big algorithm thing happened to the timeline. And I was confused as hell. Cause I was like, I could have sworn that I was averaging 200, 300 something likes on these pictures with all these, what? Yeah. Huh? And then <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden you're like what's going on like you gotta yeah, actually you you gotta turn on notifications so that you can see yeah. you know you get... <laughs> right and it's, it's, like... it's not chronological anymore it's just whatever they want to <laughs> a right. post is like five <laughs> days old you're just seeing it <laughs> right I'm, I'm, I'm just i'm just you know kind of scratching my head and stuff so it's like you know force people excuse me force people to learn to game to game the system for better or for right. worse up and it's just it's, uh, it's yeah and i think it actually kind of stunts people stunt people creatively i actually just yeah. saw something earlier today about basically people were now working on the timeline of the social media platform not necessarily what they were confident or like you apologize when you haven't posted in five days like oh i'm so sorry i didn't post you know you didn't see my stuff because you feel pressure that i have to put content i have to do at least one post a day i have to do this you know to keep you engaged you know because you lose that engagement but you are also losing your creativity so yeah i i totally feel you on you have to kind of learn all those social media platforms and the science behind it to be able to use it effectively (laughs) and that's that's why i respect anybody who's working in that space like uh people i've encountered in the past that i've had like work my social media Mm -hmm. like not like my postings and stuff but like all the other behind the scenes stuff that right really as a creative i don't give a shit about right if we keep it if we keep it in a buck like and i and I, i feel like i speak for all of us you know what i'm saying we don't give a shit about none of that we don't we just expect that this platform that we've built with right. whatever equity we put into it be re- respected for what it is. You know what I'm saying? Right. The people that have opted into viewing our content in a, in a real normal way, like they don't have to put on notifications and stuff. Like luckily yeah. I don't post that, so thank you to anybody who has notifications on for me. <laughs> but like- You have to put in all this work just to be able to see the content you want to see. <laughs> right. And then on top of that, when, if it really, if, we, if we're really getting down to the meat and potatoes of things, that's not the reason any of us created any of what we created in the first place. Yeah. So, you know, is I every day I work to remove myself from that, you know, because I, I know I got really invested into it at one point. I really got invested into um, a perception of my online image as well. Um, and then I realized that after years of being in the military and all this cybersecurity stuff and everything, I'm like, man, you're not an issue on the internet. And you're probably not going to be. And also, like, relax. You know <laughs> Those, you know, if you build it, they will come. Those that will be there will be there. You know and the I'm right saying? people, too. You're right about that. Exactly. Because you want the right audience because they're going to stick around. You want the loyalty. You don't want the, okay, just once. And then it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that's why I became such a huge proponent of, like, Bandcamp and everything. I, I've been familiar with the platform for years and everything like that and they've been doing this for a long time but especially in the pandemic and stuff like that when they were doing these band camp fridays and stuff and it really became prevalent and we've been talking about it since 2016 how much the streaming services don't pay artists mm-hmm. we've talked about it for a long long time and it's like i have stuff on streaming for optics only for those for that for the fan that is all that's all they're going to listen to that's that's for them Mm-hmm. But for the people that I know have invested in what I'm doing and everything, Bandcamp is for them. You know what I'm saying? Because I, on a good day, I get 85 cents of that dollar. 
Mm. You know what I'm saying? And it's, and I can push that shit right back into what I'm doing and I can make stuff bigger and better. Like some of the investments that I've been able to make on behalf of the music and stuff, thanks to people supporting me directly and everything, purchasing stuff, paying more than they need to. Mm. That's another thing that's really crazy. And, and that's something that you don't experience on the streaming. Like, on yeah, the streaming app, right. Because you can, what is it? To pay what you want or something. That's the feature that Bandcamp mm-hmm. has. And then on Fridays, isn't it a hundred percent of the pro- or how does that work? The bank camp Fridays, is that once a month, right? The first Friday or. Yeah. So they've been, I think since around the start of the pandemic, they started doing the first Friday of the month. Okay. Um, everything on the platform, 100% of the proceeds will go to the artists. And, and that's been extremely helpful for a lot of us. I have, I now have people that I know that refuse to buy stuff on Bandcamp until Bandcamp. Until Friday. Friday. Yeah. They'll just, they'll just rack up a list of all the stuff that came out that they want to get. And then on Bandcamp Friday, there's purchase, purchase, you know what I'm saying? And put down, and it's like, it's, it's unbelievable. Cause again, even if it's a small concentrated group of people to have that small concentrated group of people be dedicated to spending money on you every time you put something out, says something, you know what I mean? And I'm one of the people that like, I, I really thrive from knowing that, you know what I'm saying? from knowing that like I'm at least nourishing this small budding community that I've somehow been able to amass over the years. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like that workout, understanding that, yes, I wanna be here selling out this place, doing these things, but unless I put the real you know, gratitude and everything in this small community of roughly a hundred people that are taking care of me, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That, that are like, yo, yeah, you know what I'm saying? We really like what you're doing and we're willing to support you. Even if it's not convenient for me, I'm willing to support you in this way because it means something to me and, and to see that in people. It's like, that's immeasurable. And especially to see that during a pandemic when people are hard on hard on times, you know what I'm saying? Right. So it's real powerful. So I, I appreciate anything that supports that and all the platform, anything that I'm a part of, even like my distribution partners. Like I, I made sure if I'm going to give you a cut, the cut is going to be, in a way that's like equitable for both of us, that's helping both of us do what we need to do. You know what I'm saying? And, and I've been able to find those and, and rock with it. So that's, it's gonna be like that for the foreseeable future. Until I figure out how to put it all out myself, it's gonna be that way for the foreseeable future. Everybody, if you listen to me on streaming, there's no disrespect to you whatsoever, but you will continue to get my stuff on. But you need to get on Bandcamp, guys. That's what yeah. you need to do and support the artists directly. <laughs> if you if you if you really like them, like don't just don't yeah. feel the need to willy nilly support everybody. I don't believe in that. Support what you like. Like I just really? started putting money in what I like. Like I got that from Lupe. I got that painting or that, that picture from Lupe Fiasco's store. I've been a fan of Lupe Fiasco since I was uh, 15 years old. And I've never bought one piece of merch for him from mm. him. I had never been to see him until one month before the pandemic. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, eh, that's unacceptable. I want to give that man my money. Cause I, I, I fuck with him as an artist. I, I, I respect him heavily and he's inspired me to do so much of what I do, I guess. You know what I'm saying? So yes, spend money on what you fuck with. That's what I always say. I like that advice. It's great advice. <laughs> 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 so out of all the albums that you've put out, which one has been the hardest for you to create? How I feel, hands down. Um... I created this expectation once I left the army that the next body of work that I put out needed to make a statement and it needed to be reflective of all the shit I had been talking while I was in the army in terms of success and stuff. Because as with anything, I'm not going to act like it's, it's particular to being an artist, but as with anything, there are people who are not going to understand what you're trying to do. And then there are people who will flat out not agree with what you're trying to do. You know what I'm saying? Um, And in managing my relationship with those expectations um, is what drew up, drew, made the process so long because I had a lot of time that I, I wasted because I was stressing. I was actively stressing. I was medicating like responsibly, herbally. Um, (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, let me be specific. I don't want, I don't want people to 
to get the wrong impression, but I was, I was medicating. I was, I really, I really got into meditation after getting out of the army. I really got into yoga after the army. You know what I'm saying? Like really trying to find a sense of centeredness and trying to get through my issues and stuff like that. So like, that's a lot of what that period leading up to that album was trying to figure stuff out. And then once I finally got it, it was like, like what were you so worried about? You know what I'm saying? But like, for, unfortunately that was something that I needed to go through at the time. So yeah, yeah, how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> What, um, at what point or what exact, like, what point in your life did you realize that this is something that you wanted to dedicate full time, put your energy into doing? Our day. Really? <laughs> Our day at West Point. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so to explain to anybody who, who doesn't know what our day is, the, the first day reporting at West Point um the final honestly like like it's it's so poetically annoying it's ridiculous um being 17 standing on the plane in, in the final formation of the day as the sun's going down hmm. and in my white t-shirt thick ass bcgs <laughs> and and some coochie cutters because they thought because i was skinny i was short so they gave me some super short shorts <laughs> saying black socks in the low quarters pimping right in formation with my with my flight bag on wondering to myself literally my mind is racing what are you doing it was the only thing i could think about and then i answered and then i asked myself another question what would you rather be doing i was like i should be i should be in school for music i should be in school for music or i should be just just doing music like that's what i should be doing and I didn't, I didn't have, I still don't have an idea of like how, how it's going to go in the long run. You know what I'm saying? But it was like about making that decision and then just like going for it. You know what I'm saying? So I made the decision then, but then also stuck with other decisions that I made, other commitments I made prior to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I put things on hold for the reasons that I put things on hold, even though I was still able to produce and put out material and stuff like that. But yeah, our day. <laughs> wow. I, that, that was a surprising answer, but... <laughs> So what was your first, like, what was the first song that you ever, that you ever made? And who did you share it with? Who was the first person you shared it with? So, um, the first song I ever made was a song called A Better Day. The first song I ever wrote was a song called A Better Day. Um, and it was me and my friends. I was in this rap group when I was a teenager um, called DSB. And What does DSB um, stand for? Uh, them South boys. <laughs> hey, no, that's what I'm telling you, Texas. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like that's what we did. Like that's what it was. My boy had just come back. Like he had um, went to stay with some family in Mississippi. This is round about the time when Soldier Boy started popping. In you had a long shirt, didn't you? You had the long tall tea, tall tea. <laughs> what? Tall tea out. Multiple <laughs> colors, you know what I'm <laughs> kid from the suburbs, you know oh my gosh. Mean, like dressed up to a T. Didn't make no sense, right? But like that was the thing. So um, we made the song called "A Better Day." Uh, myself, my boy, uh, Cash, rest in peace. Um, my boy, Sean, aka Saint, and my boy Chris, aka Lockdown. He went by a million a million names, but yeah, we were DSB, and that was like the first the first record we actually ever did. Because Julian was like, "Yo." We should, we should, or Cash was like, you know, let's, let's make songs, let's be rappers. And I was like, what? Was like, Why would we do that? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, just, it didn't seem like plausible to me for some reason, but creating songs that we, that I liked with my friends sounded fun. So we wrote this song, we stole the beat off of, we ripped it off of um, this website called SoundClick. This is really tight, really early 2000s sounding beat. We were like, oh, this is ill. We're gonna make one for the ladies. And I wrote, I wrote the hook. Um, that was my first time writing a hook and like girls liked it. Some girls I played it for, they, they liked it. It was like, ooh, you know, whatever. I actually still have the song. Um, I still have the um, but yeah, it was, it I'm going to have to uh, listen to that. Uh, <laughs> I want to copy you. that. <laughs> I'll show it to you, but I'm not putting that out. But, uh, you know, like I said, it, was our, it was our first little, first little whatever. It's my first time trying to rap. Uh, like I said, the first, the first hook I ever wrote or whatever. Um, Man, it was a time. And he shared it with the ladies first. That was the first. Absolutely. <laughs> like, was... Outside, of the, 
I saw your homie, but I played it for girls. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, you know, like, check me out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. A better days. Wow. Better or day. a better, a better day. Not a better yeah. days. Yeah. <laughs> The whole the whole premise was, you know, if you hang with me, I'm gonna show you a good time. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Everything's gonna be cool. It's gonna be gonna be everything's gonna be taken care of. Gonna be, if stress free, it's gonna be, you know, hanging hanging with me is and you like, were what 16 or how old were you? I was probably I was probably like 14 going on 15. Oh, 14, <laughs> even better. <laughs> and, uh, you know, trying to trying to be confident, trying to try to impress girls and stuff like right. that. But hey, hey, you know what I'm saying? It I was mean, the we, time. All, we all start from somewhere. So, exactly. I mean, if you never did it, you wouldn't realize that, hey, maybe I want to rap one day. So, hey. Exactly. <laughs> it was an experience. You know? So, uh, you've said that one of um, the things you've mentioned is like, I don't take my voice for granted and talking about music just doesn't do it justice. You use, you use music basically as a method of storytelling. Uh, what message do you hope your listeners gain from your music? Excuse me. Um, that's something I've been asking myself for a long time. Because uh, I'll, I'll talk about so many things. The thing, the thing that I've been concerned with the most in the past has been authenticity. Um, authenticity and sincerity. I want you to know that like, I'm speaking either from something that I've lived or something that I've seen in close capacity, you know what I'm saying? Or for other records that I have, hey, this is completely conceptual. This is literally just a, a pure story that I'm telling you, you know what I'm saying? But it's, it's usually some, some, either some combination of those or one of those three things. Um, but in terms of a central message, maybe it's just speaking to like a greater sense of like connectivity, like all of us, again, being common to people, making decisions, doing things, living our lives. Um, I'm a huge proponent of doing things that are enriching for your life. Not necessarily pleasure seeking, but things that are enriching and, and not, not that there's anything wrong with pleasure seeking, but like in the right, in the right amounts, you know what I'm saying? And, and holding yourself to whatever standard that is that promotes growth, that promotes uh, well-being amongst those around you and everything like that. So I'm still answering it maybe um but just know that i'm figuring out i'm figuring it out just like any of us right so for the thing i just want people to be able to trust that i'm going to be able to i'm gonna give it to you how i know it and whatever you pick up for it you know maybe somebody can tell me one day you know what i'm saying maybe somebody can like fully convey what it is because because they're able to pick it up i don't know just yet i just know whatever is inside i'm trying to get it out and i'm trying to relate to whoever it needs to be relatable to you know, in, in that right. particular moment, because I believe in, um, I believe everything I have, like my, none of my music necessarily has a shelf life, even the stuff I don't want to put out. Um, it doesn't have a shelf life. It, I think it's all very intentional music. So if it doesn't jive with you right now, that's fine. Um, but everything I create has a time and a place. And if you're at that time and place and you're listening to that record, it will reach you. You know, and if you're not and you, and you don't get it, but like you still like it or something like that, cool, it's fine. But like I have, I have, I have records all the time, stuff I've been listening to since elementary school that I'll go through and I'll re-listen to purely because I love it. But then mm -hmm. I'll come back around and be like, oh, wow, this has really affected me in this way. Or this has really touched me in this way. Or this has really influenced how I see the world and how I interact with the world in this way. You know what I'm saying? So that's the best I can offer. That's it. I can't right. I, I can't I can't say it's gonna make you prettier or 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 better looking. You don't get, you know you don't get more more um, hosed. And I use that gender neutrally. You know what I'm saying? I use that gender neutrally to be specific. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like whatever. Yeah, I'm not making no guarantees. I'm just out here trying to give it to you how I know it. That's it. Right. So speaking of authenticity, uh, one of the things you mentioned uh, with this is fine is that you've learned to accept things that you cannot change. And that when you held on to a lot of things that actually stopped you from bringing out all these creative things that you wanted to, it kind of, it, it held you down. Yeah. Um, 
how did you come to a place of acceptance? Like what methods did you use or how did you finally accept those things that you couldn't change? Um, a combination, like I said, of the yoga, the meditation, journaling, um, expectation management. Um, I, I know, again, for someone like me, that's very, 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 very feelings based. Um, managing my expectations is going to be something that I have to do daily. Um, I have expectations of people, I have expectations of things, processes, all this other stuff. And if I get too hung up on them not meeting my expectations, I'm going to impede my own life by being worried about other people not doing what I want them to do when I cannot make them do exactly what I want them to do. Mm -hmm. Therefore, all I can be in charge of, you know what I'm saying, is me and, and the things that I care about, putting time and money and, and, and sweat and equity into the things that I care about. That's it. And then however they grow or mature or, or again, come back to me or don't come back to me or, or whatever, it, it's not up to me. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's been kind of like a relinquishing of control or whatever, you know, um, regardless of what you call it, a relationship with God, a relationship with the universe, a relationship with whatever your higher power is, is like relinquishing that control to it because whatever we're here to do, whatever you're doing, like pursue it, pursue it, you know, pure of heart, fully, whatever it is, like, just do it. Because like, whatever it is that you do, regardless if somebody else deems it valuable or not, whatever you do is bringing some type of value to the world. Mm. You know what I'm saying? As long as you're not hurting nobody, whatever you're doing is bringing some type of value to the world or whatever. So it's like, if you're put on this earth to make cakes, then make cakes, period. Like, don't be pressured into like, uh, cake. Okay. You own a bakery? Uh, <laughs> like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's how they'll say it too. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, look at you, Chef Boyardi out here. Like, even though I know Chef Boyardi is not a baker, but you get my point. The old baker <laughs> popular, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, that's not the point. Like, whatever, whatever your particular flavor is, like, that's your flavor. Like, period. Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't, like, one of the biggest things I learned during the uh, that's been exemplified during the pandemic is like there's an audience for everything for everything stuff that i didn't even think people had in common there's audiences for like i got familiar with reddit during the during the uh during the reddit. pandemic yeah reddit reddit opened my eyes i didn't know that there were like groups for some of the things that there are groups for like completely random shit and i'm like and there's like thousands of people who are just, oh, I love this thing. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Or like, I'll see an artist that I've never heard of a day in my life mm -hmm. that might live down the street and they have 3 million followers. I'm like, what the fuck? And people say this, people say this stupid shit all the time. And, and excuse me, people say this all the time. Oh, who's that? I've never heard of them. They're not popping, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, fam, do you know how many people there are in the world? Like, truly, like, are you, are you, in, are yeah. you aware of how many people there are in the world? Like, yes, there's only one Beyonce. Right. Okay. There can only be one. Right. But there are a million people in the world. And just because person A doesn't like it doesn't mean person Q won't like it. Exactly. And then it becomes about not trying to impress person A, but trying to foster the relationship with person Q. Mm. Person Q has been like, yo, this is really cool. And person Q is operating under the understanding that, hey, you're still learning. You're still growing. And this is getting better every time I see it. Wow. Keep going. Right. You know what I'm saying? right. Whether you're established or not, like, just keep going. Like, that's the relationship that I'm worried about. You know what I mean? So um, I don't even remember what I'm answering, but. <laughs> no person key. About how of learning acceptance. <laughs> yeah, accept, acceptance. Yeah, yeah. So accepting those things that I can't change. And, and, and again, like, just, just mitigating being um conscious uh freeing myself up of ex expectations not expecting myself to be perfect not expecting every song i write to be earth shattering not expecting every album i put out to be like whoa you know what i'm saying like not not expecting everything to be perfect or or, or whatever like it's it's do the work just do the work because like 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 we said like literally every time every time you do it you're gonna be better every time you go to the gym to practice that lift you're getting better yes you're getting stronger but your technique is getting better mm. you're saying your approach to it is getting better your your, your pre-workout routine is getting better everything's getting sharper across the board so right. it's like we can we can it's like almost like that blinders thing with certain things it's like nah this has to be like this and it's like fam it can be like this though and this 
or this might be way better than this. Mm. But like, but we're like, no, nah, based on what I know in the world, it has to be like this. Based on what person A likes, this is the only way I can do it. <laughs> it gotta be like that. If I'm yeah. a, if I'm a rapper, I gotta be I gotta be certain things. I gotta mm. rap about certain things. I have to speak on certain topics. I have to be a certain amount of masculine. You know what I'm saying? Like like there's expectations. As if there's like one like, formula <laughs> for everyone to to do whatever it is, even though there's many ways to get to mm. wherever you want to go get to. But they say a million ways to skin a cat, even though I'm not skinning cats, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's one of the weirdest sayings. I'm like, who's out here skinning? <laughs> yeah, right. And like for what purpose? Yeah, like, for what reason? I mean, like, what's wrong like, with the like, what's wrong with the cat? <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Um, I have one final question for you, and this is actually a, right. not music related. But a huge fan of yours, um, aka my sister, asked me to ask you, <laughs> what is your favorite anime? And if someone is starting out, you know, just watching anime, what would you recommend? Oh man, my favorite anime. Um, <sighs> Lord, uh, I watch so much, so much <laughs> anime. Uh, I watch so much anime. I read so much manga. I will say, um, I'll start with like recommendations because it kind of depends on like what you're going for. So like, if you're if you're in a, a little bit more of like a fantasy kind of realm and like you're in, you're kind of something that's gonna like walk you into it, like in a in a in a in a way that like a lot of us who who have been on it since childhood have come into it. Dragon Ball Z, Naruto, One Piece. Um, bleach you know those type of shows and stuff like that if you're somebody who doesn't necessarily like like more childish like themes but you want something a bit more like still like anime and everything same still with the same aesthetics but like a bit adult more or adult theme not necessarily you know, with kids or teenagers uh cowboy bebop samurai shampoo um those are two of my absolute favorites two massively done anime that i've seen multiple times um but a current favorite right now, um, Demon Slayer, um, Attack on Titan, even though I have a, a very troubled relationship with it currently, or um, My Hero Academia. And other than that, I'm going to stop nerding out. One of, <laughs> one, of, one of those titles that I mentioned, any of them is good. Um, if, you, if you want, you can hit me. We can talk anime. I can give you a million recommendations. Like We, we, can, we can talk at length because I do this. And, That's... and the, people, the people I talk to, we do this. You know what I'm saying? We put in time with these shows and stuff. So. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, entertaining that question. I mean, sure. I figured you you'd have a you know ample knowledge on on, yeah. on that. <laughs> 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 so, getting back to music, uh, where can everyone find? Well, we did mention Bandcamp, so I'm gu guessing that would be the main source um but other social media platforms or anything that anyone can reach and stay updated with your work uh, for sure um so my central website uh fifth from the third.com that's really like the the main hub for everything um outside of that infinity limit.bandcamp.com that's where you can uh buy all the music i have uh, I don't have any extra merch up right now but i'm still having i still have monotonies in cassettes that are available a lot of digital music um, available bundle discounts, so on and so forth on all social medias. You can find me at um, VTH underscore INFL. That's Instagram, um, Facebook, uh, you know, Twitter, and the rest. If you're on Clubhouse, find me on Clubhouse by the same handle, um, you know, so on and so forth. Again, I got a very whatever relationship with social media. So I post stuff, I post a lot about my, my music, my art, my nerd stuff my family, whatever it is. Uh, so I don't know, come say hi. Uh, tell me, I don't know, something, something random about yourself or whatever. I'm always down to like talk to people and stuff. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much again for doing this. Like, you know, it means so much to me that you took your time to talk to me. It's always a great conversation with you. We always, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much like just having a great conversation with your friend. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I'm honored. Thank you. <laughs> All 
All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. Bye.